All right, I've learned once I log in, I got to. We are live. <laughs> okay. All righty. So let me get back to you. Welcome, viewers, to the African Healing Podcast with Dr. Sherry Manjara Tomlin Tal. And today we have a special guest here with us in our studio, uh, Dr. Rick Wallace, a psychologist uh, who's practicing in Houston, Texas. Correct? Correct, correct. <laughs> so Dr. Rick Wallace holds a dual doctorate degree in theology and psychology. He is recognized internationally for his work in performance psychology and trauma healing and he works with clients in Europe, Africa, Australia, Canada, and the Caribbean. In addition to his academic success, Dr. Wallace has experienced a great deal of business success. And over the past 35 years, he has founded, launched, and brought more than 47 companies to profitability. He is now the current founder and CEO of Rick Wallace Enterprises, which includes subsidiaries like the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, and Publishing, Master Fitness 21, the Financial Brain Thrust, Myriad Business Solutions, and more. And so his passion has been saving young Black boys, and that's been revealed in the Black Men Lead Rite of Passage Initiative. And this is a program created to fill the gap of missing fathers in the Black community. And so, Dr. Wallace, welcome to the African Healing Podcast today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay. All righty. So I'll make sure we are recording. So that's important. Okay. And so let me say that over again. Dr. Rick Wallace is a distinguished psychologist, probably the most influential psychologist of our millennium. And we welcome him to the African Healing Podcast today here with myself, Dr. Sherry Manjara Tomlin Tao. And so we were just talking about the Black Men Lead Project. Let's begin there as and you know, let our viewers know what you've been working on with that project. Okay, the Black Man Lead Project uh, is actually an initiative that I started uh, as a rite of passage. And my goal has been to create a universal rite of passage for young Black males uh, to be ushered into Black manhood. Uh, the way that it came about was a study and search into the catalysts and the influences behind African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. Uh, I was looking for mitigating factors, ways to reduce it. And I discovered five primary elements of components uh, that influence uh, uh, African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. And I need to say this uh, because I believe in giving people that just do. Uh, this work came on the shoulders of Dr. Joy DeGru, who's probably most known for her work in post-traumatic slave syndrome, but she's done a great deal of work in the socialization and understanding uh, African-American adolescent violence. Matter of fact, she created the first uh, African-American adolescent uh, male violence uh, respect scale, which is going to play out in our discussion today. Uh, Dr. Howard Stevenson, who is at the University of Pennsylvania, also is a giant in this area. Uh, so I definitely want to recognize them. But basically what I discovered is there are five primary elements. Number five is uh, urban hassle. Urban hassle is all the things that inner city kids deal with, uh, navigating drug violence, uh, I mean, drug activity to go to school, gang violence to go to school at home. Uh, on, on the Northeast, in the Midwest, L trains running all time of the night, sirens all time of the night, gunfire, all these things create an agitated state uh, that lend to it. Being the victim of violence desensitizes uh, the psyche in a way that leads to a higher risk of violence, being a witness of violence. And then we get to the interesting part. Number two is the lack of proper racial socialization. 
uh, and I'll come back to that. Number one is the feeling of being disrespected. If you visit prisons for and, and you poll uh, young black males uh, that are there for violent crimes, when they tell you why they did it, 90% of it is going to be some kind of way they felt disrespected. And so while it's hard to address the respect issue, it's good to understand it. And with Dr. DeGruz's respect scale, you are able to predict before it happens the risk of a kid acting out. And if you have that kid under your tutelage, you can work with them. But socialization, what we found is not only does proper racial socialization reduce the risk of African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. It also reduces the risk of dropping out, which uh, impacts the likelihood of being incarcerated because we know if you drop out uh, before you get your diploma, you're five times more likely to become incarcerated. It also increases the likelihood that they will develop a skill set that will allow them to earn a um, livable wage and sustain a family. So there are all of these positive positive uh, notes. So I created Black Men Lead initially to deal with primarily the violence, but over time I have seen the benefits and the impact of the type of men it creates across the board. Uh, so it's become one of my strongest passions. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, we're looking at the epitome of Black excellence, which is <laughs> Dr. Rick Wallace here with us today. And uh, tell us about your childhood, Dr. Wallace. <laughs> um, um, I, you, go ahead. Yeah, I know that you were a, uh, you were born to a teen mom, right? She had you. And we have kind of similar stories, but your um, outcome is a little bit different. But we ended up actually, you know, on the same path. Right, yeah. right. So... Uh yeah, so tell me about your uh, younger years. Okay, born to a 15-year-old mother, uh, an absent father. I didn't see my father for the first time until his funeral. Um, but fortunately, I was reared by my mother's grandparents. So my grandmother's parents adopted me and reared me. And fortunately, the structure they bought to the home and the high demand played a role in what I would become at um, towards the end of year two, which sounds crazy, but it's actually real. Towards the end of year two, about to turn three, my grandmother noticed that I was talking since nine months. So she, she noticed that I would hear things and I would repeat it verbatim. And she decided that she was gonna take the Bible and teach me the story of the creation word by word. So I literally learned how to read by word recognition because she would point to each word and she would teach it to me. Once she taught me the entire thing, I obviously had it memorized. Then she taught me how to recite it. So at the age of three, I became the little boy that was known around Houston and surrounding areas as the little boy who did the creation because she would take me around the churches, schools, all type of organizational places and, and put a mic in my hand and I would recite it. So I always joke to people and say, man, I've been a public speaker since I was three. Uh, but it gave me a, a sense of confidence. Uh, it introduced me into the thing that I love to do the most, and that's teach. Uh, and I didn't realize it then, but that's what I was doing. I was sharing a story. Um, and so that started. And then I had a love. Probably the biggest story is when I was five, 1972. I'll never forget. I was five years old. Uh, this is still during the time that the vacuum cleaner salesman, the cleaners, the linen company, uh, encyclopedia salesmen, everybody came by the house to sell you. Man. Yeah. Yeah. And the milkman. Yes, exactly. And so uh, the encyclopedia salesman came by and, you know, again, I'm reading like crazy. I'm reading everything. I'm reading the back of hair sheen bottles, anything I can get my hand on. And so he came in, gave his pitch, and she looked over at me, and I had this big uh, deer in headlights look, and she bought the entire volume. And I was five when that happened. I read the entire volume by the time I was 10. Mm -hmm. And I've been reading ever since. I read 100 books a year, and that's not including research or anything. I am a reader. Um, 
to have written 26, 26 books. My grandfather said, you like to talk a lot. He says, you like to talk a lot. So let me tell you something. For every word you say, you need to read 100. And so that was my challenge. If I, As much as I talk, I got a lot of reading to do. And so I read every day. Uh, it's how I grow. And so, but that that set the course of my life, reading. It's like it opened up and, and I drove them absolutely nuts, quoting all the stuff that I read in that encyclopedia. Did you know? Did you know? They were like, oh my God. But it opened up and it, I guess that was the beginning of research for me too. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's been natural in that sense. I just you know, was able through academia to learn how to do it in a structured way uh, that it could be respected and trusted. Yes. So when I was growing up, we had the Britannica and the uh, the Green and White Encyclopedia. Yeah, we had it all. And I read it all as well. So education was important in my household. And it seems as if this was an emphasis, uh, you know, that your family uh, made as far as, so you came, so let's, let's backtrack a little bit. You came from a, in, you know, a beginning that wasn't ideal. It wasn't ideal circumstances at all. No. You were fortunate enough to have supportive relatives that made the right uh, call, made the right, um, and gave you the right tools. Right to be successful. And the number one thing after listening to your story is education. And that was the same thing for me, even though I came from a mom that, you know, left me with my grandfather and never came back, you know, uh, and I ended up with a relative that was abusive. Even though I had that beginning, education was the key. Now let's take a look at our society as a whole here in America. Women are the number one uh, black women, right? Mm-hmm. Are the most educated, they say. Is that true? Yes, from, from the studies I've seen, um, uh, the matriculation of young black women uh, into higher education uh, is per capita. Uh, I think that needs to be understood. Per capita, percentage-wise, we educate our black women. Um, we are lagging in as it pertains to our men and their reasons why. Wait, wait, wait you're jumping ahead of me. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry. I, okay, I, I go ahead. I wanted to okay. yeah, highlight that part. So tell, because we're trying to figure out where the breakdown is and, you know, how we can uh, understand each other. Because okay. that's one thing I see about our young folks, the generation, you know, that are not Generation X like us, uh, there's some issues there. So go ahead, tell us about the research on black men in education. Well, what, what, I've, what I've learned is, we, and, and we have to be honest with ourselves here, is the way that you subjugate or control of people is by uh, fragmenting and separating and breaking unity. I remember um, watching an interview of J. Edgar Hoover in the 60s, and they asked J. Edgar Edgar Hoover, uh, what was the greatest threat to national security? And this is a time we're in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Um, We had just come through the Cuban Missile Crisis where Cuba had Russian, Russian missiles aimed at the US. We have all of the upheaval in the Middle East with with Arab nations. Uh, China is making a push to become a world power economically. And his response was black unity. Mm. And if you follow the impact and influence of the FBI and the black community during that time, you find that a great deal of their resources was in disrupting black unity. COINTELPRO was a major portion of what disrupted and disbanded the the Black Panther Party, the Black Nationalist Party, and played a major role in, uh, everybody talks about the crack epidemic in the 80s. They don't remember the one early in the 70s where Black hoods were were flooded with drugs uh, and we now know where it came from. Uh, So when we look at 
uh, education and we look at the disparity between black women and black men, what we have to understand it is, is by design. Um, I always say this, I say that we as a race will only get as high as our women can spiritually lift us and we will only get as far as our men can physically lead us. We need each other. And they understand that we can educate their women, we can give them a, a financial affluity, we can give them, but if we uh, hamstring the men, and if you look at it, it's seen in an incarceration, it's seen in education and a bunch of other places, uh, we still hamstring the race. Um, there's a dynamic that's missing. And so when we uh, look at it, it comes from that. And then again, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to turn, turn it back over to you. One of the areas that this starts at is early as five years old in the uh, educational process. We start to alienate young black males. I wrote a position paper on uh, the disproportionality of uh, young black boys being referred to special education. So it starts as early as five years old. They are uh, designated as having oppositional defiant disorder or ADHD. And then they are what prescribed by school psychiatrists uh, with psychotropic drugs like Ritalin, Vyvanse, Concerta, uh, Adderall. And these are Schedule II drugs, which are highly addictive. You, you know, you being in the medical field, understand and know exactly what happens with that. And so the alienation process begins because they never fit in. They never feel accepted. They never feel they belong. And so it increases the risk of them dropping out. And we just said that when you drop out of high school or you drop out of school before you get your high school diploma, you're five times more likely to what, become incarcerated. So we're hurting them away from academia into the prison system. So they're becoming institutionalized, but in the wrong way. Okay. So these young black men uh, in, the older black men that I talked to, a lot of them, they don't have an interest in the educational system. And, and they probably shouldn't because it's not designed for black people. So, right. you know, I homeschooled my children um, and a lot of people are getting education and it's really miseducation. So that's a problem. Right. Okay. So for us to encourage them to continue in a, you know, system that's not designed for them, what would you suggest at this point? Where do we turn as a community? Because even if we say, okay, Black men catch up to Black women, you know, it's like, okay, but this is going to teach you how to not be successful. Your outcome is going to be just mediocre or, you know. Right, right. The educational decision. And you're going to be in a lot of debt. <laughs> right. Uh, all of these things that you've mentioned are so vital in understanding this dynamic. So uh, when you talk about education, uh, I, in, in my 16th book, The Miseducation of Black Youth in America, I defined education as being more than simply the acquisition or accumulation of academic skills, but also being the empowerment and preparation of black youth to grow up and go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and not only compete, but win. And that actually starts, that's why socialization is so important. That actually starts during the developmental years when we are giving them a sense of identity, when they are discovering who they are and we're planting the seeds of what's possible. Um, that's why the home to me is still the best place to educate because the people in that home generally speaking, are gonna be the people who love you and care about you the most, okay? And their goal, my goal as a parent is to prepare you to go out and do the best you can. The goal of the school is to prepare you to fit into corporate society or into the workforce and find your place. And that doesn't necessarily, or rarely does it work out well for blacks. Even blacks who seem to believe that we are well paid in corporate America or in whatever industry we operate in are being, uh, for lack of a better term, raped of our value in, in, in correspondence to what true value we bring to the table. And we have been, put a ceiling has been put over us and what we expect. And so in the home, we are able to sit up and say, this is what you can do, this is who you are, and there is no ceiling. 
the only ceiling in your life is the one you accept. The only limitations in your life are the ones you accept. And then we open that up. And that's what happened to me. And I don't even realize if my parents knew to what level what they were doing, but it was like, that doesn't apply to you. And then because I felt that way, when I did go off into a place, and this is another blessing for me, I went to an all black high school. I went to all black elementary, then I went to a magnet school where it was diverse. And then I went back into an all black high school where I had all black educators. And these people were there because they wanted to be there. They were there because they wanted to gift us. They chose that school district and that school because they knew they were gonna be educating black minds. We have probably per capita during that time, I graduated in 1986, from 84 to probably 90, we have per capita more lawyers, more doctors, more nurses than any school in the Houston area. We produced because there was this expectation. Uh, you know, another couple of schools that, that were notable in Houston was Sterling High School, Jack Yates High School, again, all black schools that were producing uh, phenomenal uh, outcomes. But what happens is if we don't get them in the home. That's why I'm behind homeschooling. And if you do the research, and I'm pretty sure you have if you've homeschooled, because I homeschooled my younger kids. Um, uh, if you look at the uh, statistics, uh, Black children who are homeschooled are performing at probably three times uh, the, the level of Black children in traditional educational environments. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And it's psychological, it's systematic. The, the, the system itself isn't designed to teach as much as it is to institutionalize or to program children mm -hmm. to, be, to become uh, what? Uh, more cooperative or docile or compliant. Compliant is the word. More compliant within the system. So you're taught what to do, how to do it, and then you plug in. And so that's part of the problem. And so when it comes to black males, what we have to do is get them early, socialize them into an expectation. And with black men lead, that's what we do. It's, it's simple. For instance, the number one principle, there are 11 principles. The number one principle is a black man never brings harm or does harm to a black woman. And so we set the stage. So much of what we see is paraded in front of us is the opposite. And while what they're parading is a small portion of what's real, like the idea, if you if you if you poll America, black men are trifling, black men are violent, black yes. men are, are are dumb and stupid, black men are don't take care of their children, and actually a stock a, two studies, but one by Pew, the other by Kaiser. And both published with CDC says that black men are the best father figures, uh, and that's imposing, and, and that's including whites, Asians, and Arabs. We are more engaged, more involved. Of course, you got those who aren't. You got those who have been taken away by the system. But when you look at it as a whole study, we're there. We're giving more of our income towards our children, and we are there to help raise them. And that's not the image that's being presented. So when it's not being presented, those who don't have father figures start to see what the media says about them and they start to buy into it. And so we are buying into a false narrative. And so is the so so are those who are judging us. And you know, and we are the ones that have to rewrite the narrative. I agree. <laughs> yes, indeed. So Last time uh, I was on your podcast, you have a podcast. Are you doing it weekly or? Uh, we are doing it weekly. Dr. Dr. Blanchard and I have taken a break. We both had some things going on that we needed to get straight. So we're hoping to get back on that. I still do the Black Voice almost daily. Um, and uh, I have a podcast on Spotify called Ascension, uh, and it deals with the totality of our existence uh, in business, but also in the community, uh, a lot of things we deal with, but bl the Black Voice, which is on YouTube and uh, Ascension, which is on Spotify. Yeah. And, but the one you're mentioning is actually the teachers. Yeah, when I was- Yeah, the okay. teachers, that's Dr. Blanchard and I, Dr. Blanchard has a heritage out of Jamaica. He, um, I think his grandfather was Jamaican. Um, and so he, 
came up with that. And so, I mean, we did an entire, we uh, actually produced a, uh, a track um, with um, a, an artist out of, uh, I want to say uh, South Bend, Indiana named uh, Sane Brown. Uh, and so it it turned out to be pretty good, and I'm excited about what we have coming up. So yeah, uh, I, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the last time I was on your podcast, there was a viewer who turns out was my friend <laughs> that sent you that question that says, "Okay, because Dr. Blanchard has a doctorate in in education." Education, right? have a PhD and I have a DNP. So they were saying, oh, look at all these doctors on your, you know, on your show today. And if I was quick thinking, which I'm not, cause I have ADHD, so uh, I'm just all over the place. But if I was quick thinking, I would have said, you know, what Dr. Rick Wallace does is a lot of research with, you know, that's what you're prepared to do with your degree. Um, and what I do with my degree as a DNP, a doctoring nurse practitioning practitioner, is to take the research that you produce, you know, um, in the studies that you put out and like bring it to the community, bring it to the clinical setting uh, as evidence based practice to change, you know, practice. So. I wanted to explain that to our viewers, what our different degrees, and I guess Dr. Blanchard, he would teach whatever you're. <laughs> right. Well, for instance, like you said, in your instance, what you would do is you would take peer reviewed research uh, as evidence backed um, strategies or therapies or treatment options uh, in, in the field of psychology or in the field of dealing with that particular area, but in any area, what someone with a doctorate is doing is saying, especially a PhD, what they're, what they're saying is, I'm gonna go out and I'm going to ask some questions. And you can do that in quantitative value where you can literally measure numbers and, and it's highly statistical influence. Or in psychology, it's a lot of qualitative studies because you're asking questions and people are just giving you their answers and you've gotta be able to interpret that. So you, lose, you, you use a lot of scales and other different things to create quantitative value to these questions so that you can still have measurement. But for instance, uh, one of the theories I came up, this is book number 23, uh, The Undoing of the African-American Mind. And it's an introduction into my theory of collective, uh, collective cognitive bias syndrome. And it's directly connected to uh, intergenerational transmission of trauma, uh, which is one of the things that got me caught up in epigenetics. Uh, so, I mean, there's this big rabbit hole uh, that explains the whole totality of it. So with me, it's about saying, why do we do this? Okay. And an extent of, there's so much that has been in the Black collective accepted as culture. Right. And you being a, a, a DMP understand the importance of statistical significance. In science, what we we have different barriers where we call something statistically significant. Uh, in lay terms, all it means is that it is happening at a level where it can't be explained away by coincidence, that there is causality and that if it isn't dealt with, it will continue and it may even exacerbate. So when you see these things happening, um, the easy explanation, especially when it's being pushed upon you and told you, this is just what black people do then you start to say, okay, that's just who we are. We're part of, no, it's influential. And it starts back with 246 years of chattel slavery. And the question that Jar DeGruy asked, Dr. Jar DeGruy asked uh, in her book, and she asked when she does her lectures is, okay, if we've had that and we can send military personnel over into hostile territories for six month tours, nine month tours, and when they come back, they have to be treated for post-traumatic stress disorder. How is it that we have 246 years of chattel slavery, the most brutal form of slavery universally? It's not the slavery that most people talk about, not even biblically. This slavery was most brutal that this world has ever seen. And it's 246 years documented of it. And say, okay, you're free now. And then say, okay, where was the treatment? Where was the therapy? Where, where did we interrupt 
that trauma because we know now in my studies into generational trauma, um, I wanted to find out how one of the ways I found out was genetically. And I actually found that out by studying because there was an argument in the 90s. It's been, a, back then I think it was 120 years. It's been 120 years, 130 years. Let it go. Uh, it's time to get over it. Let the slavery thing go. Y'all wearing that out. And so my thing was, just like Dr. Dr. DeGruy was, I, I need to be able to evidence multi-generational transmission of trauma. In doing so, I studied uh, the Jews post-Holocaust. And there was a point where there were the grandchildren of survivors. They weren't there and they had not been told certain things, but they were having dreams, highly specific dreams about things that happened to their grandparents that their grandparents had never shared with them. And they would tell their parents and their parents said, mom. And, and so they realized something wasn't wrong. So they started to invest in. And so what we found out is there are these things called epigenetic tags that when you have a, 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 an emphatically traumatic event, it literally presses down and it expresses itself on your genes. And it influences whether your genes upregulate or downregulate. So it wasn't just psychological or emotional. Uh, and Dr. Basil van der Kolk has played a major role in giving us an understanding how trauma actually is recorded in our DNA and in our genes and our cells. So the body remembers. And he, the, uh, matter of fact, the way he refers to it is the body keeps the score. And so we started to learn that a lot of things we're experiencing in health implications are actually the reflection of a trauma that we've experienced um, because trauma and high stressful environments create a higher propensity for illnesses. Cancer's greatest influence is in carcinogens, the food we eat, they play a role. Right. Primary influence, stress. Stress upregulates cancer genes, turns them on, upregulates them, downregulates your immune system, which is genetically driven by your DNA. Your DNA is going to be the information that's in every gene that tells you how tall you're going to be, the color of your eyes, your temperament, all these things. But stress can influence how the genes express themselves and are interpreted. So then that led me into uh, the area where I got really focused, which is in adverse childhood experiences, which we, we, we refer to as ACEs. As a matter of fact, I did a, uh, a uh, workshop with Harris County Sheriff's Office where we're trying to cut recidivism. So we have a reentry program and I did a workshop with them on epigenetics. And what, 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 that, what, uh, what adverse childhood experiences tell us is there are ACEs. I'm gonna read them real quick to you. Uh, 10 primary ACEs, I've, I've identified another 10, but the 10 primary ACEs that is, is uh, accepted and uh, respected among my peers are number one, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, an alcoholic parent, I also add in any type of addiction, uh, chemical addiction, an incarcerated family member, the disappearance of a parent through divorce, death, or abandonment, a family member diagnosed with a mental illness, a mother who is a victim of domestic violence. Now, each one of those count as one ACE. When we do an ACE score, when we're grading or doing an ACE score for a child, each one of those uh, experiences count as one, one ACE. When you get to four ACEs, a child is 12 times more likely to attempt suicide at some point in their life, four times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease, which is the number one killer in America, four times more likely to develop certain forms of cancer, uh, lupus, other autoimmune deficiencies, 2.6 times more likely to develop uh, um, diabetes. And these implications carry on throughout life. Uh, they are three times more likely to develop uh, some form of risky behavior, whether it's drug use, promis sexual promiscuity. All these things come out of what they experience as children. And then we, we have this saying, we say it all the time, we don't realize that the, the depth of it. And that is that traumatized people tend to traumatize people. So now you have a child growing up. And this goes back to the question you asked about little boys in education. You want to know why little, little, little Johnny can't sit still in the classroom and you're, 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 you're ready to classify him as being learning disabled, but you haven't looked at the culture. 
You haven't looked at where he came from, what's going on in his home. And you have to have the capacity and ability to say, okay, we need to be providing. And that's another thing that Dr. Blanchett specializes in, the wraparound services that create student persistence that says we will persist until we graduate. What keeps people from dropping out? And it's, you know, it's hard to learn when you're trying to figure out uh, what you're going to eat. It's hard to learn when you don't know if the lights are going to be on when you get home. It's hard to learn. All these different things are a part of culture that are tied to our experience in so many different ways. We couldn't possibly cover it today. But what we have to look at is with these genetic influences, what are we doing about it? One of the things we've got to do is we've got to create a better environment for our children because those stressful environments are playing out in their adulthood. Um, that's one of the things uh, that we've got to do. Um, and, and then we've got to be able to understand the genetic influences. We talk about so many things that we can change and we don't invest in those changes. Yeah, so here we are <laughs> uh, with these genetic influences and our environment and lack of certain um, uh, things like girls are not being raised a certain way anymore, or they're not equipped with certain, uh, you know, skills that are taught to them by their mom. So men are looking for a certain woman, and now they're realizing, you know, something's not right, something's missing. This is, you know, not, right. uh, yeah, the dating uh, thing is not going good. And these are some of the reasons, right? It's, right. So people have questions, but they need to understand what the problem is. So this is why I invited you on the African Healing Podcast today, because there's so many people that don't realize what's happening and where the breakdown is, okay? And a lot of it is um, because of trauma. A lot of it is because of lack of good upbringing, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, a lot of it is, and in, in because of resources in a lot of cases, um, or I don't know what happened after Generation X, <laughs> just, let, just let me put it out there. Um, but we're trying to figure it out at this point so that people can be more tolerant and be more um, understanding instead of saying, okay, I give up on Black women or, you know, or the Black community or. Right. And another thing that I've been very vocal in is the need uh, for the restoration of the Black family nucleus. We go from 1960, uh, where 75% of Black youth were born into two-parent households, to now where it's reversed to roughly 73 to 75% are born into single-parent households. And I tell people all the time, uh, and I end up having to explain myself because you know we, we've been trained to be offended by one another. And so we don't listen for the sake of gaining an understanding, we listen to determine how we're gonna to respond to how you offended me because you spoke something that made me uncomfortable. But uh, one of the things I say a lot is I cringe every time I hear the term strong black woman. And people say, what, you got a problem with strong? No, I was reared by a strong black woman. Um, I've had strong black you know, women in my life uh, I admire strong black women. The problem I have with that term is normally when I hear it, it's being applied to a black woman that's doing something she shouldn't have to do, or at least she shouldn't have to do by herself. And so that's a black woman that's overweighted. She's tasked with something she's actually not genetically designed to do. There's a reason that there's naturally, inherently, universally a family structure. Uh, regardless of species, but if we're talking humans, you've got feminine energy and masculine energy. We're designed different. Uh, and you being in, in, in the field of psychology and understanding neurologically how the brain works, you understand that women, their brains move from left to right, highly intuitive, they feel. Uh, they function from that. that. That's why they drive on being loved and accepted. Men, our brains go backward to forward. We are driven by accomplishment, what we can do with our hands, what we can achieve. And that's where we're attacked most in this culture, in this society. It's stopping us from being able to achieve because it breaks our spirit and it lowers our uh, expectations. 
and we are vision visual. And normally when women hear men say we're visual, all they can think about is how you see my body. No, we are visual. We see in you what you don't see in yourself. And that's why when you have a good man in your life, he's telling you, you are, you can do this. You can do that. I see. He sees your vision clear to you. You feel it, but he sees it, but he needs what you feel. He needs your intuition and your children need both. They need the structure and the discipline that a man brings just with his voice. My grandmother was way more of a physical disciplinarian. Than my, I can count the times on one hand, my grandfather touched me. Ask me who I feared in that house. Your grandfather. <laughs> his voice. It would be like. I, it, it, it's, God coming down from heaven. Yeah. It's like my grandmother say, I like, can I go to the park? Go ask your daddy. Never mind. That's okay. You know, I'm going to go in the room and play. It was just, and then I realized once I got to know him, because when I was like, and this is important too. So I hope people are listening. When I was eight years old, my grandfather came to my grandmother and says, I got it from here. You've taught him. You've put what, what needed to be put into him. And now it's time for me to take it from here. So from this day forward, you do not discipline him. You do not put your hands on him. Uh, he's mine. And when I, so about four years later, I asked why. He says, if I continue to allow you to be physically dominated by a woman, mentally and emotionally controlled by a woman, you will expect a woman to guide you, to lead you, and to tell you what to do. You have to be willing to be able to stand up and make decisions as a man and lead as a man. You're not better than she is. You're not more important than she is, but your role is to be out in front. Nothing should get to your family without coming through you. But you, if I continue to let her be the dominant force in your life, you will find a woman who will dominate you and you won't be able to lead and you will never reach your full potential. And so he came in and he taught me that. And that's the way I rear my children. My sons, hey, I got them. And they understand that doesn't mean you get to do anything you want to with your mom, because if I find out, man, you're going to talk. It means that we're going to learn how to be a man, not by me telling you a whole bunch of stuff, but by you watching me. And that's the part of manhood you miss when the man isn't in the house. You know, and I tell people this and I, I'm trying to do it in, in the way that's not so graphic. But I said um, there are just certain things a woman can't do to us for a son. She can tell him all the things she thinks a man is supposed to do. She can tell him. But even with social learning theory, the vast majority of that is observation. It's observing it and seeing it. So you can tell him and everything else, but you know what he's absorbing? He's absorbing your feminine energy. He's absorbing your need to win arguments. He's gonna be highly more argument than an average man. He's going to want to engage everything from a place of emotion. It's what you naturally do. And it's what makes you strong, actually. And so, but it doesn't work well for him, but he's absorbing it because he can't see it. And so he becomes this person. And so what we have to understand is when that balance isn't there in the home, women are doing an unbelievable job being providers, but that weakens other areas. I tell everybody, you can take a shoe and make use it as a hammer, it's not going to make a good hammer. And eventually it's going to damage the shoe. And the shoe isn't going to work as well as it was meant to work. So what happens is when we ask, we ask our women to take on the roles of things that our men should be doing. And then I was a single father. So I was trying to do things that mothers were supposed to be doing. And I wasn't good at it. You know, it's just, and then you have to, you have a capacity. You, when you're at hundred percent, you're at hundred percent. Now, if I'm taking my, if I'm supposed to be at hundred percent in my masculine energy, and that doesn't mean being mean and aggressive. It means being a protector. It means being a provider. It means speaking properly into the lives of the people you cover. That's masculine energy. People talk about toxic masculinity. And I tell people that doesn't exist. There's no such thing as toxic masculinity. If it's toxic, toxic by nature and by definition, it's not masculine. Masculine in its true function is love and protection. It's a covering. It's a willingness to die for what you love. That's masculine energy. Uh, attacking a woman, beating on a woman, mis mistreating a child, uh, shooting up the neighborhood. None of that's masculine. That comes from brokenness. That comes from uh, a lack of identity. That's why it's so important to socialize young Black males. Why? Because you explain to them what it is. And I'll say this finally, and I'll give it back to you. We look at the disruption of our teenagers and don't understand. When a young male comes to the age of about 13 or 14, there's this transition out of puberty into adolescence. And what they are searching for is a sense of self. 
at a higher level. This is where they are starting to strive to be a man. But in order to do that, they need to have clarity of who they are. They need to know who they are in their relationship with God, whatever that may be. They need to have an understanding of what they want to be in career, what their roles are as men, how they feel about this. Most importantly, what we give our kids in our homes as parents, values, interests, and principles that govern how they live their lives. If there's frustration and ambiguity in that area, it shows up in disruptive behavior in school and in the community. And then we we're wondering, why is he behaving that way? We didn't give him a clear sense of who he was. And he's frustrated because he's trying to figure it out. And guess what's happening while he's trying to figure it out? The world is telling him something totally different than we would have told him or that we should have told him. And so he's trying to decide, am I the thug on the television or what's being presented in music or what's being presented in the movies or what's being presented in the media and the news? Or am I actually capable of doing something exceptional and extraordinary? And what's what's going what's going to come forth is what's prevalent. And right now, what's prevalent isn't what we want expressed. So then we have these things we need to deal with. damage has the media and marketing from other communities to our community, you know, um, how much damage has this done for our people? Oh, the media plays a massive role in, in, in our sense of identity, in the sense we, uh, of what we find important. Uh, it in controls what we get uh, uh, enraged about. I'll give you a prime example, and then I'll give you two resources. Uh, that I think everybody should read. Um, in May, the first two weeks of May, reports came out. It was on the news, but they didn't give it a whole bunch of playtime. Just sent up and they announced it that 30 children in Cleveland alone went missing, predominantly Black children, predominantly female. We have a roughly around 75,000 Black women missing right now. Uh, let's go to, let's look at that first. 30, 75,000 black women missing. I'm gonna get back to the Cleveland thing in a minute. 30, 75,000 black women missing. One black blonde girl who's on a trip around the US with her bar friend goes missing. The whole world stops. It becomes front page news. Everywhere. Everybody's looking for her. And then even- after, White blonde. Yeah, the, the blonde, I can't think of her name, but it was a young blonde white woman, girl. She's young in her early twenties on a trip. They living in a van traveling around the world, just doing it. And they were doing it on their Instagram, I think. And all of a sudden she came up missing. Mm -hmm. And the bar friend showed back up in Florida where his parents' house. And so eventually they found her body and he, he eventually killed himself. They found his body off in the wood in the Everglades. Uh, but the point is we get women going missing every day and we don't get that coverage. Uh, there are even people in the media that acknowledge that it's not the same. But 30 kids, predominantly black, predominantly female, go missing in two week period in Cleveland and crickets. Five millionaires go missing in the sub and everybody in the world knows it. The media controls it. That's just one element. So there's no value for our people in our community. Is that what you're. No, what, what I'm saying, there's definitely. Uh, a lag in value. We're not valued the same. We're not given the same. And it sends a message to us mm. subconsciously that they're more important. Mm. Okay. So then what you have to look at is there's a book called Propaganda by Edward Bernays. It was written in 1933. Uh, to give you the sense of that, he is known as the father of PR. It was Edward Bernays that literally got women to smoking. Most people don't know the history of this, but smoking was a man thing. Uh, it was a man thing. And Edward Bernays made smoking glamorous. If you go back and you look in the 20s and the 30s, you see the women with the gloves on, the long gloves come up here and they've got the cigarette on the long uh, smoking stem and they're smoking. He increased the revenue of the tobacco industry by bringing women into it using PR. It was the writings and the teachings of Edward Bernays that a young Adolf Hitler studied to create his propaganda campaign that made German citizens think that the Jews were their enemy and that exterminating them was acceptable. That's the power of it. 
uh, Tom Burrell, who is the CEO emeritus of the largest black owned PR firm in the world, wrote a book in, I want to say 2010, called uh, Brainwashed. And he talked about how the media is used to create an image of black people. And then they write the narrative. Uh, there's a reason that you see things. It's, it's amazing when you look at how our, our culture and our hood mimics what we see in our music and that it, you, can't, you can't see it in the same density in other areas because while white children might be the, the largest uh, audience for rap music, it's also diluted by everything else that comes in. We get a heavy dose of it and we get the image of this is who we are. And you go into the average community, you ask the ch child, how are you getting out of the community? If you want to get out, if you want to live a life and you want to have a nice life, how are you getting out? You don't hear, I want to be a DMP. I want to be a PhD. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to own my own business here. I want to be a rapper. I want to be a football player, a basketball player, or a drug dealer. Because they've been told, and that's the image they get. I'm either going to be a D-boy, or I'm going to be athletic, or I'm going to be able to spit on this mic. Mm. And that's how I'm getting out of the hood. And all of the culture that comes with it. And then you wonder why they behave a certain way. Because the influence of that information, you are what you consume. And this is program, programming them to go to the penitentiary, basically. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a direct correlation with the alienation from the system, educational system simultaneously programming them for antisocial behavior, which ultimately ends up with them being incarcerated or at the very minimum being shunned and um, alienated within society as a whole. Right. So... <laughs> Before we continue, let me just say that, you know, when I go to places like Africa, where there's like maybe more than a billion, a billion and a half uh, Black people walking around, okay? Mm -hmm. The one thing I enjoy is to get off the plane and no matter what I want, no matter what I buy, it's all made by Black men, mostly Black men. And I cherish it. You know, I buy things here in America and it's like, okay, I wear it for two weeks and maybe never wear it again. But if I buy something a black man made me, mm -hmm. it's like, oh my God, you know, it's like, you know, when your children make you something in their second grade class right. and you still have it. My son comes over, he's like, Ma, you still have that? Uh-huh. It yeah. that. you right. know, so this is the feeling I get. So imagine how black women, other black women would feel if we can come to that place that's what I was going to ask you about because you do a lot of online help you know help online with uh online businesses mm -hmm. how can we create a black amazon where black men are making things and black women are buying things from black men like you know like there's no tomorrow because you know we love to shop black right women. right right what? it's it's interesting uh the way you brought that dynamic forth uh being a black businesswoman you spoke of black businessmen, and there's so much power in that. I have no problem with black women getting their game on, black women doing their things. I think that you guys are exceptional. But to understand the dynamic that the black man is the most maligned in the sense of being able to get on. Um, you know, I, I read and I do research uh, and I collect a lot of data from social media. And I, I don't think our people realize how much they're being studied on social media, Facebook literally allows you to download your entire profile, every, every post, every comment, everything, and you can download it. And then if you have the software or the system, you can organize that information and gain an understanding of what people are thinking, how they're moving, what catalysts drive them, all these different things. And you're being studied that way on every, every platform you're on to know how to manipulate you. But, uh, the interesting thing that you look at when, when I first heard you say that is you're speaking of black men making things. Why is that important? Because if we get to a point where we start to support black men, black women normally with, with the things that you guys do, y'all kind of got your own thing going. Y'all help each other. But black men are, number one, very competitive with one another. 
because we've been convinced it's only enough power for you. If you give that up, if you share that and help him, he's going to outshine you. And then you're going to be left in the background and we haven't learned how to stand together. So it's really important. Uh, but to answer the question, how do we do it? The first thing we have to do is we have to get through and get by the mentality of the white man's ice is colder. Um, that was actually, and very few people caught it. That's this uh, organization called Urban Intellectuals. They do a lot of educational stuff now, but at one point in time, Urban Intellectuals had a counterpart to Facebook. Same design, you go on there and you post and you share, you do all that stuff. I, and I did everything I could to get black people over there. And we hung out right there at Facebook. And so there it is. And the thing is, you, you are on their platform. So they control what you can post, what you can't post. And they censor the heck out of content. So they don't, you only get to see what they want. Then somebody like me who has multiple pages, but even on my personal profile, I have the max 5,000 uh, visitors and something like 13,000 followers on top of the 5,000 actual friends. And on any given day, only 7% of the people that are on my friends list see what I post because they throttle down um, through algorithms who sees what. Mm. And so they're controlling that. And we're never going to really truly get the thrust of what we're trying to give in message and in lesson and in opportunity and in resources if we're constantly there. But the first barrier we've got to get by is the whole idea of black unity because we're working against ourselves in that. We don't trust one another. We'll sit up and ask 50 million questions about, like if I was sit up and say, I need you to donate to Black Man Leader to the, the Odyssey Project, which is what houses my research and everything else. I need you, well, why did you do this? How did you do this? Blah, blah, blah. Um, United Way comes on and say, we need you to give. Okay, where'd I give? And uh, I think their CEO, make something like $400,000 a year. Okay, so that type of thing is what we, we automatically accept what they tell us to do. And we are, and we question with ferocity what they're doing. And you can look at it. And fortunately, I've done it so long that all you have to do is Google and you can see it. And still, I get very, I've had officially, I've been doing this for 35 years now. And I officially, had the Odyssey Project, I turned my music business and my entertainment company, which was Odyssey Entertainment, into two entities. The Odyssey Project, which is a research center, think tank, and community engagement mechanism, and Odyssey Media Group, which is what my publishing and everything else comes out of. But for so, so for 20 plus years, it's been there, and I funded 95%. Dr. Blanchard has probably funded another 2% of that. So 3% of what I've done over the last year. I might be giving more credit to donors than I have, but put it like this in 20 years, I haven't raised 20,000. Mm -hmm. And we can do that in a month or two in the services and the works we do. And so that's a problem. Now we'll, we'll, we'll go up and blow up Louis Vuitton. We'll blow up Gucci. We'll blow up all that stuff, spend money we don't have, and we won't invest in our futures. And so the, the understanding has to happen on a grand scale that this is how it's supposed to happen. If you look at any other group, especially if we start with uh, the Jewish sector, their dollar bounces within their community about 17 times. And it only leaves when it has to in order to make something happen. Mm. The Asian community, nine to 10 times. The Arab community, nine to 10 times. Latino community, seven times, something like that. Our dollar doesn't bounce one. As a matter of fact, on average, our dollar leaves the black community within the first six hours of it getting in our hands. We get our checks on Friday. We go to the Korean nail shop. We go to the Arab liquor store, the Arab gas station, the white grocery store. And we haven't spent one dollar in a black owned business. And even, here's, here's another side of that, though. OK, so that's vertical economics. So we dominate. The beauty, the beauty, the beauty industry. Uh, it's a fifteen billion dollar industry. Ninety six percent of that revenue comes from blacks. We have three percent ownership, and it's at the bottom of the spectrum. In vertical economics, what we know is, in order to survive vertical economics, you have to have ownership. 
vertically. So that means at the retail level, at the uh, distribution level, and at the manufacturing levels. Uh, we've had Black people try to get in the, the beauty supply business. You know why they don't last? It's because they get priced out by the manufacturer and the distributors, which are Asian predominantly. Mm. And so I'm going to give it to you, but I'm going to give it to you for $2 a unit, and I'm going to give it to my Asian counterpart for $0.99 cents a unit. They're going to beat you solely on price competition because your people aren't committed enough to you to spend more money with you to ensure you stay open. They're going to go with the best price, even though they're going to go in that store and get treated like thieves, get treated disrespectfully. They're going to still go in there because that's the way you guys are conditioned to think. Mm. And so... All of these things are part of our collective cognitive bias that, that I was talking about. So uh, it's a lot of work, but we have to start somewhere. Uh, I have a saying that the only way that we're ever going to truly each reach uh, true Black liberation or true Black empowerment is that we're going to need Black men. And I use men because I see us as leaders. We're going to need Black, but it includes women. We're going to need Black men who are willing to plant seeds that we may not live long enough to see come to fruition. And that's a problem for Black men because we don't get a lot of recognition. We don't get a lot of power. So we're fighting to be acknowledged. So we look for Band-Aids so that we can hurry up and say we did it. So somebody can say, look what I did. And you can get acknowledgement for it. We need structure. We need foundation. We need to build. You're not going to undo 400 years of this in a year. So what you got to say is, I'm going to take this kid who is pure at three and four years old, and I'm going to start to socialize them. I'm going to tell them who they are. I'm going to tell them what they're capable of. I'm going to give them everything they need. And then I'm going to cover and isolate them from all of that negativity out there until it sets and starts to bear root. Then I'm going to nurture them until they get to the hood. And it could be 35 before they become that powerful force that they need to be in this world. I might not be here 35 years from now. So I have to be willing to plant a seed in somebody that's going to bless my grandkids. Yes. And I've got to be able to see that for ahead in order to have that mindset. And most of us don't. We're right here in the moment. I, you know, and, and we're and we're we are literally designed not to build uh, generational wealth. I earn this money. This is my money. Right. And we the we vision. have generation after generation of sending a kid out to start at the same place we started at while they're getting head starts because they're starting with something parents built for them. To have have wealth coming down, yeah. you know, when I was, you know, dealing before the uh, the um, subprime lending crash in the real estate market in 2007, 2008, I was dealing heavily in that. Um, and I ran across a lot of stuff. And one thing that I learned was that a significant part of the white community are seeded their first house by either mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. And it's anywhere from $50,000 to $100,000 minimum on a down payment. Some were getting their whole house paid for. So they had a head start. We're sitting up trying to pay off college debt the first 10 years out of college. Right. You, we're in apartments till we're 30 something because a house. And so all of these mindsets come together in a conglomerate confusion that just simply uh, disables us and makes it to where we can't be and do what we are capable of. We are remarkable people. Uh, when we do apply ourselves, the three most, the three highest IQs in the world are three black kids under the age of 15. It's where the original people, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, the things that we are capable of doing, think about most of the stuff that we are dealing with are inventions we created that we got robbed of. And, uh, and so, we have it, but the thing is, we need to understand it. We need to come together. Again, I go back to J. Edgar Hoover. The greatest threat to national security in his eyesight was Black unity. Why he understands, if we don't break this family up, mm -hmm. we ain't going to be able to stop them. And you know when you've wronged somebody, you, you are always worried about when or if they get the upper hand, what they're going to do to you. But and so that... There's we always that like concern. other people, though. We just don't think like that. We no. just, uh, you we, know, we, we are designed different. Yeah, we just want to enjoy yeah. our life. What's wrong with that? Why we got to have all the stress? You know, why we, yeah, we look at life differently. Okay. So, um, yeah, that leads me. That's a good segue to the AI phenomena that's now 
uh, <laughs> going to be taking over. Um, we might be behind the curve, but, you know, Black people, Black men, they're champions, okay? Right. But once they uh, do unite, come together, and be educated about what the problem is, because that's what I've figured out, you know, we need to educate our people where things have been breaking down. And now that we're at that point, and it's going to take 50 to 100 years to build certain institutions and have certain structures. Right. But right now, with AI emerging, mm -hmm. Dr. Wallace, how can we now have the advantage? Because, you know, a lot of uh, Korean, Indian, Chinese, everyone has brought up, you know, bought out the businesses, the uh, in our neighborhoods, the you know, the stores in our communities, they own those things and they have the power that we should have. Right. So now, how could we reclaim <laughs> our rightful place in this universe, in this, you know, global system uh, using AI? Oh man, you, 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 you hit a sweet spot when you talked about AI. I started hearing about AI maybe four or five years ago. Seriously, I've been hearing about it a long time, but I started to really say, okay, the, the reverberations of its oncoming are starting to get loud. I can feel the vibrations. So this is no longer uh, simply an idea. This is really happening. We actually have the structure in place and there are actually government agencies already using it, been using it for years, and now it's coming into mainstream. And so I started getting with my tech guys, a couple of my clients were programmers and cybersecurity. So they had an understanding of what's going on. They sort of kind of explained to me what it was going to look like, how it was going to be. And so I started studying it before it ever hit so that I could start using it. So I've been using it for over a year in the creation of programs and online courses and, and uh, asking it for research and understanding different movements in the markets and a whole bunch of stuff. So everything from investing to starting businesses and launching businesses, scaling businesses and growing businesses, monetizing ideas, all of this stuff is going to be possible. I'm actually doing a webinar on Friday uh, to teach people uh, how to um, monetize and leverage the power of AI. And I've only marketed this webinar to my people. Like me, I signed up. I'm, I'll am i be there Friday. So how do, are you allowing any more? Uh, yeah. Um, how do we sign up if you haven't signed up already? Right. So let me see if I can actually find that link real quick. Um, I think I know it's here. But yeah, so I'm going to be teaching that um, uh, on Friday. How, how will this be a game changer for our people? It's a game changer. The one thing, well, when I had my crash in um, um, uh, when I had my crash in um, the end of like 2007, 2008, like I said, I went through a very rough time where uh, the businesses that I had built were hit hard. I made a couple of decisions that weren't uh, probably the best. I was a little arrogant. I was in this zone. I was like, if I touched it, it was turning to gold. And so I got a little arrogant and cocky and didn't follow, you know, a lot of protocols and kind of cut some corners and it cost me. And what I decided was I got to do it over. But the beautiful thing about understanding and knowing something is if you do get found, if you do find yourself in that place, you say, I've done it before. So it was never like, oh, my God, it's over for me. It was like, OK, I get to do it again. And this time I get to do it better. Right. The, first, the first thing that I looked at was this Internet thing. You got to understand, you know, Facebook was new. Twitter was new. Instagram was like a baby. And MySpace had did OK, but Facebook had pushed it out the way. YouTube was still, you know, what, you know, whatever. And so I'm like, but, but this internet is going to change the world. And so it's going to take me from being a person that's got to be booked and flown somewhere to literally being able to sit in someone's home from where I'm sitting and deliver virtually. So I said, this is where I'm going to start rebuilding. So I literally started rebuilding and launching different entities and companies and doing things. And so this is before AI. This is, you know, when I first started, we were still using HTML to build sites. Now you can sit up and build sites 
on different platforms. I use primarily WordPress when I build sites for my clients, but I use a number of other uh, creations as well. But anyway, you get to AI now and a lot of the guesswork is taken out. All right, and the automation end of it is there. So now you take an idea and you can ask through prompts. Prompts are key elements of how to use open AI, chat, GPT, all these different forms. And these tools are just rolling out the box of different ways. You can create art. You can, uh, you can literally make such a unique customer experience that you literally create this place. And one of the things that I do in my seven-day online business launch course is I teach people this blueprint that I used starting 13 years ago to literally create these online entities. And one of the things is you need to know how to do a business plan. AI can help you with that. You know, I create templates for business plans for my clients so that they can just say, go fill it out. And when you finish, you'll have a business plan. All right, you have to have marketing analysis. So you need to do marketing research. You need to be able to do a marketing analysis, understand that you can do, you can pull customer intel. Customer intelligence is everything you need to know about your target audience to be able to present them the products, the services, and the engagement they need. You can improve customer service. So now you've got all these automated processes that are rendering to you what precisely, and now we got to a point where the first version, which I think stopped being programmed and taught in September of 2021, which is chat GPT. So it's good to 2021. Now you got stuff like um, Web GPT. I, 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 I got so many pulled up right here. Jounce. Uh, you have right Sonic, which literally pulls from the internet. So now it's not just what it's been taught to do. It takes what it's been trained to do and it will sit up and it will actually go search the internet for the most recent answers. Not only that, it will allow you to upload your own material and it will render uh, whatever you ask it to produce in your tone, in the way that you write. It'll study you and produce stuff the way you would have produced it, but it's gonna do it at a much rapid pace. So now you scale out and you step back. And so that's what I've been doing over the last year. I've been doing a lot less one-on-ones and I've been doing a lot more program development that allows me to scale out because I don't have to be present to present it. Now there's still something to be said for the human element. I'm still most effective when I'm sitting face-to-face -face and I'm working solely one-on-one -on -one with you. But it's like, it. Literally, you're only limited, uh, and I tell people all the time, you're only limited by, by what you're willing to ask or what you're willing to seek or what you're willing to try. And the more you push it, the more you'll discover and the more you'll learn. So it's going to cut learning curves. It's going to open up opportunities. One of the things the internet did for me is it almost completely eliminated the racial uh, the racial component. Now, now, what I mean by that is the only areas all of my businesses aren't branded with my image. And one of the things I try to teach black business owners is you need to learn how to raid their economies because that's what they do to us. Yeah. Yes, you know, yes, we want to support black businesses, but we want black businesses that provide services outside the black community. We only make up a, what 13% of this population. We want, we want to be able to create products that they want. Why? Because that's their money. Now, when they give us our, their money, we need to do what they do. They, we, we give them our money. We spend, I tell people all the time, we're the only people in the history of the world that I could find that finance our own demise by how much money we spend into the economy of the oppressor. Now, now here's the thing, though. If we create things, and they love our stuff, too. That's the beauty of it. They absolutely love our stuff. I know. They stole, like, how much art from back in the day? I mean, oh, yeah. We're still just finding stuff that they stole. Right. <laughs> and so what happens is we need to learn how to sell. So I have entities that you can't go there and see that a black man owns it. That's the beauty of it. That's also the beauty of most things. When you get on the Internet, if you want to reach a larger audience, you get to create the brand in the way that it does it. Now, I am branded in a lot of things that I want my people to get a hold to because they need to see a black face. They need to see that you can have success. And the thing that I actually probably win, win, go ahead, you know, go ahead. The thing I probably actually celebrate the most about myself is my academic achievements. You know, I 
I'm a, I'm a, a hound for now. I, I've had a white guy that I studied and I got up under him because he taught me a lot. And he said, you are an absolute knowledge hound. I know when you call me that no matter what you're going to say, that actually you're trying to fish my brain. And he said, I absolutely love it. But what happens is uh, I, I enjoy more the things that I've done outside of academia because the, th the true nature is everything that I've learned, I could have learned without the degrees. Mm -hmm. But there were certain doors that wouldn't open if I didn't have them. And there were certain people who wouldn't listen if the yeah. letters weren't behind my name. But the things that I teach, I knew before I had the degrees. Matter of fact, the first degree, the, the institution came to me and asked me what I enroll in their program. Mm -hmm. We want you in this program because we want you to approach this particular situation. And so that's how it started. And so I exited my academic career. I think I'm done. I don't think I want to go back and get nothing else. I exited my academic career owing zero dollars. Mm -hmm. Not one dime that I ever borrow. Mm. And that's just understanding my value. You want me in your program. This is what I've already done. You want me in your program. This is what I want from you. So I negotiated my way into spaces. And then I was invited into other spaces because of that. But what I like is to show people, look, all you have to do is have a vision. Believe in the vision. Pursue the vision. Make the adjustments along the way. And over time, you'll get it. You live in a universe that God designed to reciprocate your energy and your efforts. No man can stop that. White or no other, uh, no other source can stop you from being what you were designed to be. Amen, brother. So Dr. Rick Wallace, what you're telling us today <clears throat> is that AI has the potential to break down these racial barriers as far as businesses, you know, because black businesses suffer, you know, because like you said, our people <laughs> believe that the other folks, their water is colder, their ice is colder. So they go over there. But now with AI, how's that going to, uh, you know, promote our Black businesses if, without people knowing that they're Black businesses? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's simple. Uh, you choose imagery. Uh, you can say create a logo. AI, there's, a, there's an AI tool that will create the logo. You can tell the what your business is, what it does, and it will literally generate multiple options. Uh, you can set your ads up to be run via AI. You can ask it um, the best wording for sales copy. You can, it's, I mean, and, 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 and I'm just scratching the surface. It's So in essence, you choose first and foremost and what I tell people, one of the things I teach in my seven day online course is this is what a business is. When you sit up saying, I want to start a business, all a business is, is you looking at your current skill set and saying, what problem can I solve? Right. One of the biggest mistakes that I see people make when it comes to business is they say, man, I love this. So I'm going to create this and then I'm going to go to find people who like it. That's the backwards way to do it. People create stuff they like. Then you got to go find other people who like it. No, what you do is you find a large group that has a problem and you say, do I have the skill set to solve the problem? And the thing that AI does is even if you don't have the skill set to solve the problem, ask AI. AI gives you the background information. You develop the skill set so you can start off in one area, develop a skill set, say, over two or three years and then double back down. And you can go from charging ninety nine dollars for this to $9,000 for that over three years, you increase your revenue exponentially over that time. And AI simply gave you the, the little structure through which to do it. And so a lot of things that you don't have that you may have in the past had to go out and hire four or five different people to give you that structure. You now just have to simply understand what you need and how to ask AI to do it. And then the beautiful thing about it, if you don't know what to ask AI, ask AI what to ask it. I mean, it's that dope. I mean, so uh, I get excited just thinking about it because I look at what I've done in researching it for four years and then using it for a year and realize I haven't even gotten started yet. So those five, six, seven people that we no longer need, uh, I'm probably going to be one of them because AI you know, is going to be able to assess the patient, prescribe the medication, 
in the future. So where does that leave uh, us being um, ahead of the curve <laughs> in that area as far as not being uh, phased out? Right. or Right. So, so, so what, here's what happens. Goldman Sachs has predicted that over the next year or so, between the next year and year and a half to two years, that AI will replace or eliminate 3 million jobs globally, 300 million jobs globally. That's 300 million jobs that currently exist that will not exist as they exist now because of AI. The first thing that the average person does is because we've been conditioned and trained to believe that the system controls your opportunity is, oh my God, they're phasing me out. No, they just gave you a tool to blow this whole thing up. You've got to start asking questions differently. You've got to look at it. So, okay, if they, if now AI is going to be doing this, where do you need to be? You need to be the person that's controlling access to the AI that does the assessments. So you need to be the person that says, okay, what role can I play in this? How can I? And the crazy thing is, Jerry, is you can go ask AI. If I am a DMP right now and eventually AI will start doing the uh, assessments and prescriptions and all of this. How do I leverage that and see what AI tells you? It, but that's the thing. You got this thing. Imagine everybody's brain in one place, mm -hmm. all the genius of the world in one place and everything that you said. That's why I, I, there's so much knowledge that we haven't tapped in. And the reason is we, we, we've been pigeonholed into believe this is your opportunity and you can only have this opportunity if so-and-so gives it to you and now what the internet has done and now add ai to it it says i don't need your permission to be great wow so i'm going to step from underneath the ceiling of what you tell me i can do as a dmp and i'm going to venture out into this universe because remember what we're doing right now with this visual uh with this with this zoom meeting and this virtual meeting is we're doing what they showed us on the Jetsons in the 1960s. <laughs> and everybody said, man, that'll never happen. Oh, man, that's crazy. Right. And what happens is somebody decided I wasn't going to stay in the box. We have cell phones. Well, first of all, we had regular telephones as kids growing up because Alexander Graham Bell said, I'm not going to stay in the box. You were able to fly to Africa because Orville and Wilbur said, I'm not satisfied with riding. So I'm going to create something to fly. And everybody told them they were absolutely ridiculously stupid. And they got outside of the box. People are, I saw where a high schooler broke a, a record that had stood for, I don't know how long in the high school ranks, but we've got middle schoolers running miles uh, that was once times in the mile that was once considered impossible. Roger Bannister broke the four minute barrier in 1954 before that, it was believed that a four minute running under four minutes in a mile was impossible. Not only did people believe it was impossible, they believed that if you ran the mile in under a minute, you wouldn't live to celebrate it because your heart would explode. <laughs> so Roger Bannister, now here's the beauty of it. Roger Bannister ran the mile in 1954 in under four minutes, broke the uh, four, four minute barrier. And they asked him, what did you do? How did you train? What did you eat? If I was asking all these questions, he says, I didn't change anything in my physical training. I ran it 1,000 times in my mind. Mm -hmm. That's the power of the human mind. If you unleash the mind, nothing is impossible because everything that we think is impossible or what uh, is being proven to be possible, Every, all the things we're experiencing now was once thought to be impossible. Here's the crazy thing. Over the next two over the next two years, 2,000 people ran the mile in under four minutes. You want to know why? <laughs> it stopped being impossible. Right. Now, you've got over 40,000 people who have done it, and some of them are teenagers. They haven't even fully developed into their full physical capacity. It's not even a thing anymore to run the mile in under four minutes. Mm -hmm. But it was once thought impossible. And so what we have to do as a people is to start to explore the beauty of who we are. Remember we create the freaking pyramids. <laughs> so, I mean, our minds can go places. Right. So then what we need to start doing, think about it. Everything that has benefited agriculture and it came from our mind. Nobody wouldn't commit, nobody but a black man create the cotton gin. I'm tired of picking this pair of cotton. <laughs> we gotta do. So, I mean, through necessity, we've created right. so much stuff. 
That same brilliance is there. You want to know how I know it's there? Take one of your kids, because I've, I'm, you know, I've got kids 37 to 9. Right. And take your kids, like my teenagers that, you know, that are growing up and coming adults now. Well, most of them are. I'm almost out of it. But you take them and say, okay, I'm going to block this on your phone because you don't need some block. Those kids within a matter of minutes have figured a way around that block that these geniuses at Verizon and IBM and everybody else created, they've, they've circumvented it in minutes yeah. and created an entire way to do it that you can't track and trace. Mm-hmm. I've watched them. And, and, you know, my only reason I can keep up because I'm dealing with tech and I'm learning and I'm going, so I know what you did. And so I have, but I'm, as soon as I get that, they are ready to the next solution. It's like, you don't, you're not going to catch me. I'm going to do this. Exactly. Now, but that's, yeah. But, but imagine that same brilliance being applied to something that says, I'm not going to be poor. I'm not going to suffer. I'm not going to beg for crumbs off of a table when I can build a whole house myself. And so that's what we're talking about here. And so uh, with this AI thing, uh, what I'm doing is I'm get, uh, I'm doing the webinar. The webinar is going to be somewhere around two hours. I'm going to do a 30 to an hour Q&A after. Uh, I'm giving away my seven-day online business launch course. That's a six hundred course, six hundred dollar course. I'm giving away the Mind Unleashed course, which we just talked about unleashing the mind. That's a six hundred dollar course, and I'm having a drawing where I'm going to draw one name and one person is going to get to work with me for a year. This is a fifteen thousand dollar package, but I'm giving it away. And uh, again, I've only marketed this to my people because this is something I want to bless my people with because the average person can't afford to work with me one on one. And that one person is going to be challenged one way from me outside of the things I'm going to push them hard to do while I'm working with them is that you've got to bless 10 other people. You've got, and see, one thing that I've always said, uh, and I'm pretty sure you've heard me say this before, is some people look to affect the lives of other people. I look to infect people. And people say, what does that mean? Uh, when you're infectious, it, in, it, you being in medicine, understanding when you're infectious, it means you're contagious. So when I infect people, I infect them with passion. I infect them with confidence. I infect them with faith. I infect them with a dream. And what happens? Infected people infect other people. So I get to touch lives of people I never meet because I'm infectious. And so what I train people to do is be infectious. Don't just share something with somebody. Share it in a way that they get excited about it to someone else. Ask them why you're excited. And now you're sharing with them why you're excited. You just affected someone else with an infection someone else gave you. That's how you change this situation is we've got to be, be infectious about the possibilities, infectious about our brilliance, infectious about what's capable. And we change the entire trajectory. We've got to stop consulting outside of ourselves for permission to be what we are designed to be. Fantastic, Dr. Rick Wallace. Well said, (laughs) and there's so much more that I wanted to, you know, uh, talk with you about, discuss with you today, but um, I hope you will agree to come back. Oh, most (laughs) definitely. For another podcast with us here, because we didn't even uh, have the opportunity to talk about love, romance, and relationships, which is what a lot of people are um, you know, um, wanting to get more advice about and, you know, uh, so we would have to schedule that down the road, but, um, what you have told us today is not only mind blowing, I just give you kudos to you and Dr. Blanchard as well for, you know, being so determined to get through and to break through, you know, uh, the, blocks and barriers that's existing in our community and that's what it takes we we can't give up so we have so many people in our community that just give up so easily on their marriages on their businesses on their families you know on their lives their own lives you know so i uh i'm encouraged and i hope a lot of people that are watching us today are also encouraged to uh take advantage and find your place in what's gonna uh, be coming down the pipe with this AI and technology. I think right now, if you go to Africa, 
they you told just told us what your children do when when you try to block them i mean if you go to africa without any degree without any resources they they master technology over there right so imagine the africa and the american uh you know black community just like dominating this thing this is like and, and, and I, I agree 100 i think that that's the thing that we've got to push we've got to get it and it's going to take some time if we're honest with ourselves because the programming is so entrenched to do things their way and to dismiss something that's coming from black people um that you know i look at the minds that you mentioned dr michael blanchard dr amos wilson uh, Dr. Uh, Joy DeGru, Dr. Naeem Agbar, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson, who is the reason I'm in psychology in the first place. Um, Dr. Howard Stevenson, uh, and I can go on Chancellor Williams. I can just literally go down the line. Uh, Yosef ben Yakinen. I mean, these brilliant minds that have come on and they set the standard. Mm -hmm. And we still lean towards other people's ideas about who we are when they don't benefit from us knowing. Right. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm past that now. So my social media team is nextna.com, N-E-X-T-N-A-A.com. Check them out. Dr. Rick Wallace, his email, do you, should I give out your email, Dr. Yes. Wallace? People want to enroll in the AI course or any of his, uh, you know, programs that can uh, change your life. If you want to, if you're ready to do some life changing um, strategies, please contact Dr. Rick Wallace. His email is CEO at the at sign Rick Wallace, PhD dot link. OK, so your final words before we uh, wrap it up today, Dr. Wallace. Uh, I would I just want to encourage everybody who watches this to search out the best version of yourself. Stop consulting outside of yourself for who you can become and stop consulting your past. Stop asking your past for permission to become the great person you can become because the answer isn't in your past, it's in your mind. It's in your imagination, it's in your dream, it's in your vision. And you haven't come close to what you're capable of becoming but you're going to have to pursue it. You're going to have to be committed to it and you're going to have to finish. I shared something on social media earlier today that I read sometime a long time ago that commitment is following through on what you following through and being law to what you said you were going to do long after the mood that caused you to say it has left. And people ask me all the time, how did you publish 26 books? How did you do this with this many companies? How did you do that and that? And it's because you're smart. It's because, no, I know what I know because I was persistent. If I had to define myself in one word and the success that I've achieved, relentless, not because I'm better than anybody, not because I have some special gift that no one else has, it's because I refuse to quit on my purpose. And when you make up in your mind that you're going to refuse to quit on your purpose, that's absolutely no one who can stop you. So I wish you the best. You are so amazing, Dr. Rick Wallace. I can't wait for you to join us again here on the African Healing Podcast. And I want you to have a blessed day. <laughs> Stay. You do yeah. the same. You do no. the same. It's always yeah. a pleasure. And I look forward to coming back. Yes. Thank you so much. I know you're on your way out somewhere. So. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping here. Hope that everybody is doing OK. Uh, look, I'm not going to be long. I'm here to talk to you uh, straightforward. Look, the easiest thing to do is to complain, to complain about what others, what others are doing to us individually and collectively, to complain about what's not right, to complain about what should be going on. Uh, that's the easy thing. The hard thing to do 
is to take action, to do something to change the things that we are not satisfied with. For my entire adult life, I have spent uh, energy, effort, and time and money into gaining an understanding of the things we go through, the things we face, the uh, mechanisms and machinations and, and, and all of the things that are working against us and what we can do to change that. And uh, a, a couple of decades ago, I created the Odyssey Project as a research center, as a think tank to take what we find in our research and to use it to develop strategies and solutions. Uh, also as a program development and implementation arm to take what we can learn and create these mechanisms and programs and initiatives to uh, deploy within the black community. We've done this for years. If you follow me, you know the work we do, we consistently do, and we'll continue to do. We need your support. It's that simple. Look in the description box. You're going to see a link to support or if you prefer to give via Cash App, which some people do. There's the organization's uh, Cash App account handle in there also. I mean, we got wraparound services that include mental health, uh, men and women, uh, special services and advocacy programs for women who have struggled with domestic violence or in, uh, in some instances, childhood sexual abuse or in uh, other instances adult rate. Uh, we have other wraparound services for men for training and job placement. We are trying to make a difference, but we do need support. This is a massive and gargantuan effort uh, that's underway and it's so necessary. We're in last place in every statistical category from socioeconomics to politics to education to academics. Uh, we're in last place. And it's not because we are the worst, it's because we don't apply ourselves. We don't take action. It's time for us to take action. So I am challenging you to support the work we do. If you follow me, you know. So on that note, look, look in the description box and take action. On that note, I'm out of here. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be free.